Hi, I'm super excited. Today we'll do the second interview of a grow tent, uh, Nepal test grower. Uh, that's gonna be Joe. We already uh, know him because uh, I interviewed him for the windowsill setup, but now let's see his grow tent. Hi, Joe. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting to do this interview with us. Um, please introduce you and uh, we will see uh, what uh, we we learned from you. Hey, hey everybody. I uh, first came on uh, Remy's channel when we were going over a windowsill I had in my last uh, rental. Um, I past year or so, I moved to this place and Remy got into tents. Um, so since then, I've done a complete overhaul of the windowsill. I've done a complete overhaul of the tents and learned a lot along the way. Um, I started keeping the penthes in a tent before I kept anything on a windowsill. Okay. Um, this was midway through 2019. Um, I think it was like midwinter, like December. Um, but I went to Virgin Water Gardens, which was a place here in uh, western New York. And I looked through their collection and we're really lucky to have a local retail store that specializes in Nepenthes, Saracenia. Um, they have a massive greenhouse space and you can look through hundreds and hundreds of Nepenthes, which I think is a really nice. rare thing in uh, to get to be able to do in person. There's only a few places keeping collections like that, uh, much less sell in retail. So okay, very that nice. got me into it. And if we wanted to point some main like differences out between tent growing and windowsill, um, I think tent is lower maintenance per plant in the space. I would say, I don't know if you've noticed the same Remy, but once you put them in a high humidity space, really consistent light, you can get a pretty good bead on the watering schedule. You can get a good bead on where you want to place it in the tent and once it gets set up i find i only need to water most of these plants once a week um uh, i do come in here every other day but um for the most part it's a lot lower maintenance the windowsill i find i'm checking at least bi-weekly some in the summer it's more like four times a week i'll be watering so okay. um, just nice. easier overall especially when you start getting a lot of plants uh you can't always commit the same amount of time per Per plant okay. i think at this point between the window sills and the tents i'm probably pushing 400 plants so wow nice the tent really just helps what size is the tent um well this is my intermediate tent i i have two right now wow. um and a third is is in construction <laughs> um so this is a five by five this is pretty small i can hop out real quick yeah we'll get into that in a sec we'll get the uh nuts and bolts out of the way i guess first okay so this is the inline oh we were sorry we were gonna do the brand it is a vivasun yeah. um i don't think the brand is incredibly important but uh okay in general i think they're about the same be ready to patch some seams because that is what seems to go they okay. kind of separate but you can sew them back up with some high test fishing line works really well okay thanks for the tips so what is it this tube this is my night drop controlled fan um so this guy has a little controller up here okay. um with like temperature settings um the reason i have that is because in the winter this space gets down to like 50 degrees this okay. basement um and i need like a fail safe in case it were to get too cold in here i want that fan to kick off so it's set to kick off at around 55. Um, so but it's heating it is it doesn't adjust the temperature it simply measures it um so i have a probe that goes from the controller into the tent right okay. here uh -huh. Let's see but it's right there yeah and when the temperature reaches 55 that will kick off regardless of the timing schedule i set so this guy runs for about six hours a night kicks on around midnight kicks off around 6 a.m um, but that temperature can intercept it if it were to get a little too cold. Um, okay. So the temperature on the basement is cold and it's pushing the air of the basement inside the tent. Yep. It grabs air from around this window. I put it up here because this is a, it's a pretty old house and that is just like a plexiglass window. Uh -huh. It's not a real window. So it's really drafty. I can feel it up here. 
So I just grab that air and shove it in. In the summer, that's very important um, because it's not as cold down here. So I need that little extra cooling. Okay. Um, get that mic drop. Moving over here, I guess we'll go over uh, my humidifier setup real quick also. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my main unit. I just do fog um, because I, I just don't like to play around with the misting lines. I find they kind of get clogged and every year or so they need cleaned. So I just switched over to this because I found it a little easier. Um, I have a second one for when I go away on like vacation. I'll cut both of them back to real low and just run them both and that'll get me for like a week and a half um and if i really wanted the plants then i don't have almost any maintenance in it. so yeah you're right how the humidity is inside for me i was surprised that i i had uh, i installed the misting system but i'm still struggling it was too much water even 15 seconds four times a day it mm -hmm. was too much water the condensation the on yeah. the the wall, the uh, wall was dropping to the floor and then mm -hmm. it was not good so i installed the fan to blow on the ground so on the floor so all the yep. water on the the ground just uh, evaporates. evaporates because of the the heavy airflow but now i turned the the misting system off for a week and uh, i'm still, still not, human. yeah yeah that's uh Misting systems are excellent if you have a drafty space. Like if I had a real greenhouse and it was a really large collection, mm -hmm. I think it would be essential. Mm -hmm. But uh, tents are pretty nice and airtight. Like it doesn't get much better. You have complete control um, over how much airflow you get. Yeah. So you can really, I think, especially with those like Velcro vents in the way back, um, kind of finagle it into the exact, yeah. exact amount of evaporation you would like i have a very similar setup here with my fan it's just like an inline fan that's facing down yeah um this is my heater down here um, oh. it's a 500 watt amazon basics heater and it kind of sits right in between the wall um and it's covered by the little vent uh okay i don't know what you'd call it drawstring um, that's also on a timer and a temperature controller, so it's set to, I think, 76 during the day and uh, 55 at night also. So this fan just pushes air across the heater. Um, I have this little piece of insulation because it would actually cook a plant right here. Um, I used to have Ampularia by Hamada here, and it got cooked. <laughs> oh, okay. So I put this here, and I keep my lowland plants here. Um, so the fan kind of pushes across and then the hot air is a little drier and it hits where my water pools up. So a very similar system to what you were saying. Um, just try to keep that, keep the water moving out of the tent as much as possible. Okay. Very nice. A quick question I need to ask the trays. Are you putting some water on them or, or it's just to the trays in this case are really just to let me control where the water runs off. Okay. Um, so I already, I have this plexiglass sheet to prevent the lights from getting wet. Mm -hmm. um, but the one issue that I could have is it could still like kind of catch the edge and run back down and in. Okay. Um, so I just punch, punch holes in the low side of these trays, which is oh. the front edge. Um, so that all the water, everything I water in the back doesn't catch that, backside and run down because it will um okay. so it just lets me control the water flow off these trays um huh. that would i would say that was the biggest plus of this the new tent is i built the shelves a little small so this is a four by one and a half foot shelf but that gives me enough space on either side to kind of let the trays overhang a bit um buys me a little bit more space than if they're really tight i find because when they're pushing up against the edge mm -hmm. um i don't know i feel like i pack them out a little more and it just gets strangled in there pretty fast yeah. wow uh do you what light it is what kind of light do you have oh uh, i have an eclectic mix remy i really i'm kind of a light nerd oh yeah and in that i mean i just like these old weird lights um 
So this is like a reef tank light that I just turned the blue settings off of. The reason I like a lot of these old reef lights are they were just super expensive back in the day and technology moves so fast that you can get them for super cheap and they are like incredibly waterproof. Like this light could almost could run underwater for a period of time. So I don't have to worry about all the humidity and those other factors that I would have to worry about with like this regular T5 here. Okay. Eventually it will rot out. So okay. it's an inevitability of all lights. So I would say my big three are LED strips of one kind or another. Everything from like this reef light at the expensive end to a shop light. This is uh, like an Amazon Basics <clears throat> metal frame, two bulb. And I think this is actually a little too strong um, for a lot of these plants. I'm getting a lot of yellowing to some of the leaves, some red spotting on certain plants. Um, and it's just telling me a little too much light. For the most part, uh, the two LEDs I prefer are these, I forget the name, Brea, something like that, LED strips. They're daisy chainable. Um, a little strong, but not nearly as much. And the YesCom panels, um, a little harder to get your hands on these. I don't know about how available they are in Canada, um, but the white ones seem to sell out pretty fast here. So okay. when I see them available, I usually grab a couple extra because, again, you can see they're not very robust. They kind of rust out in these corners, um, and sometimes you'll get half of the array burning out. So they're very okay. affordable. They're like 20 bucks a piece, but um, they yeah. don't last more than You have what you pay for. What you, yeah. uh, humidity do you have? Um, this tent will range, I'm trying to think here. On a low, on like a really cold night or really after a really cold night, um, I would say 75 is as low as it gets. And I never let it get above 85. So I keep it pretty tight oh, in wow. that range. Um, right after I water, it will get pretty high. But the other thing, I guess, to keep in mind is my temperature and humidity probe is way, way up at the top. So even though I'm only reading 85% up here, I wouldn't be surprised if right on the ground there wasn't like a uh, barrier layer, um, something that was hovering around 100% down here. Okay. And you don't have a problem with the water uh, condensation on the side of the wall, on the ground? I I actually do. I think it's inevitable, especially yeah. because it's so cold in this basement. The walls yeah. will be often like during the day, it's 80 degree air in here and it's 50 out there. So it's going to condense. You can almost yeah. see the algae on the wall itself. Yeah, But same, uh, same for me. The main thing I recommend is find find your low point. For me, it's right there. And then I just shove a towel in there once a week and kind of sop up the water. If I'm going to do a really intense watering, I will just put a towel there ahead of time and then uh, just throw it in the dryer afterwards. At least that's what I've been doing so far. It's not the best system, but it works. Yes. At least for me. Oh, oh you good? My, yep. I have an LED or a T5 right above the uh, entrance. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, so if you, um, I don't have any questions and I see so many nice plants, uh, okay. can you give us a tour? Of course. Is there anything in particular you'd like to see? Anything you like? Anything? Uh, you said intermediate, which I love. The, oh. uh, that's what, really what I, I, I'm aiming for, a grow tent intermediate. So uh, trying to not go too much highland or lowland, something mm -hmm. in between that people could have on their basements. What are the species that thrives on this intermediate condition? Um. So as far as pure species go, oh, I don't know species or uh, hybrid. Sorry. Sorry. Or What hybrid. kind of plants? Okay. This, just that's good because I don't have many species. Okay. I think there are some ethical dilemmas with a lot of these uh, species, unless you know it was in like tissue culture and collected with proper permits. So I tend to gravitate towards the hybrids. Mm -hmm. um, conveniently, they almost ubiquitously appreciate like, Uh, intermediate conditions. It is hard to find a a hybrid with at least one intermediate parent that won't at least tolerate it. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, uh, something that you might not think would love it, 
but really does very well. Oh, so right here, this little guy is, uh, it's called Nepenthes Kraken. So it's Trismodiensis crossed with Edwardsiana. Okay, um, so quite Highland. That's what you would think, but I kept this plant Highland for, you can look at the leaf size, for about a year and a half. And I kept getting shrinking leaf, shrinking leaf, shrinking leaf. I moved it back to intermediate. First first new leaf, gigantic leaf jump. Um, hmm. I'm not saying that would be true for all of the seed-grown plants out of that cross, but uh, I, I'm constantly surprised. Same with, like, Velosa vichii, just thrives in intermediate. I tried it in the Highland tent. Does way better in the intermediate conditions. Um and I will say I still give them a good night drop or the best of my ability, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the condition is. I find that helps, but they can really take a warmer day. And I wouldn't be afraid to push the temperatures warmer than you think you might need. Okay. Um, just because when you're fertilizing, when you're properly lit, you have, uh, you have a little wiggle room, I think. Wow. What is it? This one here is uh, Rob Cantley crossed with Lowy Eye by Truncata. Um, this one was made by Andres Westuba in Germany. Um, it was sold as a seed grown plant. Um, I'm not sure if it really is or if it's an assorted clone kind of doing what BE does, but this plant should be a monster. Um, I'm sure, you know, all three of those plants are quite large. Uh, Loei truncata is massive. Um, so this guy might have his own tent someday. <laughs> I don't even know. Wow, but, uh, that's beautiful. Very excited about that one. Um, recent pop on, this is Peltata by Jacqueline. Okay. Um, really nice red leaves, nice and stripy, kind of an interesting shape. Um, that one was from Exotica Plants in Australia. Um, <clears throat> what else is going on over here? I have quite a few uh, Vici by Eddie's. Um, this is the Andres Westuba clone. Um, I think it's clone two on this one. Very uh, nice. Really available plant compared to a lot of the other VTI eddies. Um, kind of hard to come across, but Andres Westuba is selling these guys for, I think it's 120 to $200. Mm -hmm. And they are just super robust. Tons of Edwardsiana traits. Um, really desirable and again mind. i would think this is a highland plant but no it's... no i edwardsiana in particular i find makes crosses that favor intermediate um exotica plants i know keeps some of their breeding pure species edwardsiana in lowland conditions and they thrive and again like you you read anything and it says mm -hmm. that should be impossible yeah but they have, if you dig around on YouTube, they have videos of their flowering Edwardsiana right next to an ampullaria. And okay. some of these plants can wiggle around a bit, I guess is the point. So don't be afraid to try stuff. Nice. Um, this guy here, one of the, definitely one of the favorites also. This is uh -oh. Ventricosa by Sibiensis by Edwardsiana. Uh, really toothy. Nice and long, and it should get really large with time. At least I'm hopeful it will. Um, okay, so definitely planning for another tent because if everybody goes yeah. really big, even now, <laughs> even now, Remy, like it's just packed. I, yeah, I got I a little that. room up here. I made a little room back there, but yeah, I, I kind of have to. The windowsills are all rather full too, so yeah. we are running out of space. Um, Let's see what else is going on. We got some Northiana vicii. Uh, this was a Malaysiana tropicals plant. Um, this guy lives on the, in the sunroom for the summer, but in the winter, I bring my uh, lowlanders in and kind of cluster them here hmm. um, just around the heater. Kind of an interesting wow. one here. This is... Uh, what is it? It's Nepenthes Saber, so Ventricosa trismadiensis crossed with Loei, which was then crossed with Truncata. Wow. Um, some of these clones, I've seen some stripy ones. This one is not, but it has a ton of like Loei uh, texture to the plant, so it's yeah. really woody. 
um, very long uh, and getting massive now. Probably a foot plus leaf on either side. Nice. What kind of substrate do you use? Um, mostly sphagnum and perlite. That I would say 80% of my plants are in sphagnum perlite. I have been experimenting, uh, like Gina said, with cocoa core. Uh -huh. uh, back here is his spectabilist platykyla, um, and he's in cocoa core doing very well. Um, I actually... I, I'm back and forth on core still. It's very environmentally friendly, which is a big plus for me, but I just struggle to integrate it with all this sphagnum moss. I find it needs watered like twice as often for the first six months. After that, it, it acts just like sphagnum moss, but those first six okay. months, they're really prone to dry out. Again, so they break bad. down after uh, six months and they get more spongy? But, yeah, after okay. six months, it's perfect. It's awesome, but that first period, it needs like frequent water. And this is after soaking it for, oh. you know, you have to rinse the cocoa core. It's very important because it's collected near the ocean often, so it's very salty. So you rinse it. I use a five gallon bucket, fill mm -hmm. half core, fill it up with distilled water, let it sit for a week, dump it, repeat that five or six times, and then it's ready to use. So there is that big maintenance work <clears throat> step in there too, um, which I find kind of keeps me away from it. Um, just take some time to do that whole process. Okay. Do you fertilize? Uh, heavily, yeah. I do okay. Osmocote every other week. I do Maxi every other week. So a few Osmocote per pitcher? I do one per pitcher, but there's just too many plants for me to do them all. So I kind of look for the pitchers that are starting to go off, okay. and then I'll throw one or two in, and I'll maybe do like 20% of the plants one, okay. during one of those passes. It's just overwhelming. Yeah. So And you have some uh, nice uh, truncata, loia, uh, stira, so all those thick pitcher, woody pitcher, mm -hmm. can take a lot uh, yeah. for sure. Plant you just listed off here is Truncata by Loei down here. You have so um, many good species <laughs> on crosses. Uh, <laughs> I have been I have been uh, gravitating towards the more toothy stuff over time, but this okay. one years ago um, from Carnivoro. They're a great nursery we have here in the U.S. out of Texas. Texas, um, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I don't know, Remy. You got to start your own nursery in Canada. Duh. There's such a giant market to fill. I hope you could so. be making all of these. Maybe <laughs> one day, yeah. Wow. What is uh, the big, big plant just in front of us? Uh, this really, yeah. really tall yeah. one? This is, I'm going to have to grab the tag. I do not remember. This is one of wow. those Exotica plants, wow. monstrosities that I really love. This is an exceptional trap from it. Normally, they're a little more subdued kind of okay, still <laughs> so... yeah let's see the tag it is vent sib vent trismatiensis loia vici bastiana maxima mira oh my god you will have to <laughs> send me the, the name of this one <laughs> i will put that on the screen yeah vent sib vent trismatiensis loia vici bastiana maxima mira i will send you photos Ooh. and names of anything you'd like but that's what i mean when i say monstrosity i just can't remember that no, it's impossible. But, uh, ah. Wonderful plant. Wonderful, wonderful plant. I've had it for probably three years now. Um, it's in a big pot down here. And it's all the way up here now. Um, right after I moved, I had a different tent in the same spot. Uh -huh. And I just did a horrible job putting it together. So I completely <laughs> demoed it and started over. And this is where I ended up. I'm a lot happier with this one. But... Uh, the old one was too closed up, and it only had one massive light in the center, and I just couldn't get it to uh, fill all the yeah. gap. Yeah, yeah. Perform the way I wanted. Quick question: You have a hanging pot, right here. Can you talk about it quickly? Yeah, of course. Um, this is the kind of stuff that I think you can only really do in a tent where it's high humidity. Yeah. Even then, this is one of those pots that I water like probably every other day. Most plants don't get a lot, but this one dries out fast. 
Um, it's got a little sphagnum. It's got a little leucobrium, but it is a VGI Barrio Gold um, from Borneo Exotics. Uh, this was the main stem, and it actually shot a basil through like five, six inches of moss to uh, okay. come out up here. Um, we have the big traps. The bigger traps are down okay. here. Very hard to see it. But... So, same as uh, sphagnum perlite, and you put that in yep. the... I'm trying to untangle it but it's just a it's pure sphagnum in this basket okay um and it is just like a storage basket and i use some zip ties you can see them here um to kind of zigzag across the front and then i let it set up and let moss get going in there for six eight months and then i cut the zip ties off the front so oh there is nothing to prevent the not oh. anymore it's just the plant holding itself in Wow. Um, and then some stakes. You can always, because it's a basket, I have a stake that goes in here and then out the back. So that kind of wedges it in. But uh, for the most nice. part, the moth does a pretty good job. Nice. Um, here's one of my... Oh, that's a big baby. Crosses, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I, I got this for a steal um, from Exotica Plants. It is it's Vent Sib by Sanguinea, and it was the giant clone of Vent Sib wow. and the giant clone of Sanguinea. And it just came out with, look how thin it is, though. Oh, it's interesting. It is an odd, odd plant. Um, super excited about it. I love this thing. It's just such a weird, weird plant. I don't, I not, I don't see any of the others from this cross looking like this. Um, and it's just massive. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, it's up here now. Here's the growth point. But uh, I do plan on cutting that one in the near future okay. um, because it has a couple basils. And uh, that is the other thing I would say to people. Uh, when you start getting a tent, it's not so much a problem. But once it starts to get super dense, um, you got to thin. So, like, the amount of light this is taking up, yeah. uh, now that I have a basil or two, it's really advantageous for me to just chop that and allow okay. allow a little more light back in there. Okay. So you don't plan to do some seeds? Um, I I definitely take any opportunity to do seeds that I can, but uh, like I have a male flower on Spatulata vici right here that just went off. But um, for the most part, I don't have room in this tent to get plants to flowering yeah. size with yeah, the exception yeah, yeah. of this spot in the center, yeah. um, which is why I'm setting up one of the new ones. Um, it's gonna just be open, no shelves for the biggest intermediate plants. Nice. Um, I got another favorite over here, I guess. Uh, uh, this okay. is Ventricosa trismatiensis by Edwardsiana. Um, almost like a clone of Edwardsiana, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so, so, so toothy. Trying to catch the light better, but. Really robust grower. It slowed down since I repotted it. It's the unfortunate part of keeping any of these nepenthes is they often respond negatively to repots, but you got to do them often. So, how often? Uh, hmm. I would say I do it every two years religiously for okay. the plants I keep on windowsills, and I do it within three years for plants I keep in the tent. And the reason why is simply because I get a lot more through flow of water through these pots. So it's washing a lot more uh, minerals or anything that's break coming out of the media when it breaks down out of the pot. Whereas when I'm keeping stuff on the windowsill, they're inherently bound in that tray. So if I ever over water and that water in the bottom of the tray touches the plants again, it would yeah. wick up through the media and end up at the top of the plant soil. So okay. I'm a little more careful there. Huh. But uh, anything else you'd like to see? I can keep going for hours if you'd like. <laughs> um, what else? What is your favorite plant that you have there? Mm. Pick one, only one. <laughs> only one? Oh God, you're killing me. Um, I would say probably if I had to just save one, it would probably be this one. Um, Saber by Edwardsiana. 
Um, I haven't seen one quite this toothy yet. I'm sure there are others because um, they made a lot of these guys, but okay. they are. it is just so nice. And I have a feeling it's going to be real easy to grow long term. Um, nice. Definitely a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff, though. Truncata by Edward Siana. Oh, yeah. This one's getting pretty big nowadays. You have a lot of Edward Siana, so yes, you're really... Uh... Attracted that, that by is toothy. definitely my favorite of the species. But again, I don't own Edwardsiana simply because it is so rare. And uh, I've yet <laughs> to see anyone reliably release tissue culture other than Andres Bastuba. Yeah. And I just haven't been able to get one yet. Okay. This is uh, Ventricosa by Loiaia fipiata. Um, so it should be a cool new Ventricosa Loiaia like plant uh, someday. This okay. came from a seed-grown uh, Rex done here in the U.S. also, another hobbyist. Okay, so and the yellowing is when it's uh, too much light? This one is showing a little too much light. Okay. Um, probably a lack of magnesium, too. Um, what do you do for the magnesium? I currently don't do anything, but it's it's the new hot topic in keeping yeah, it. I heard with the, um, the, the thing for... Uh, uh, Epsom salts. I heard mm -hmm. some some things, still. and it's a pretty good argument. Like like when I look at it on paper, at least it it seems very uh, plausible, and mm. it seems to match up with what at least I'm seeing. I uh, I find I've been assuming it was light stress because I keep increasing the light, but uh, especially on plants like this one, where I haven't really been able to get growth. Uh, this plant is truncata by. Edwardsiana by Velosa. Um, this was made in Japan, and I've had it for probably three and a half years, and it's never grown bigger okay. than this for me. Um, and the old leaves, always yellow. It never keeps more than two or three leaves at any one time. Mm -hmm. um, so even if it is just a couple plants that it helps, and as long as it doesn't hurt the other plants, I mean, it seems like something worth a shot. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to try it out. Pick a couple plants and just treat them with it and see how they react. Okay, interesting. Yeah, definitely a, a topic right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question for me: If somebody wanted to to try uh, to get a growtant uh, running, what would you recommend? Um. Like a, a tips, a pro tips for uh, the first growtant. First tip would be find. Try to eliminate some variables if you can. Try to find a spot in your home that doesn't get direct sunlight, that is as temperature stable as possible. Because mm -hmm. you're setting yourself up for success. And in my opinion, that's the hardest to control, that variable. Um, once you get temperature stable, humidity can be adjusted. But until you get that stable, it's it's kind of a moot point. Yeah. Um, because as you change your temperature, the amount your heater is running, you're going to get a lot different uh, evaporation rates. Yeah. So start there, and then I would give more light than you think you need to. Definitely uh, push over lighting rather than under, and then back it off slowly um, if you start to see some burning. Um, I think these plants, especially when you're keeping them at a little higher temperatures, can take a lot more light than people give them credit for. And... They can take it a little drier too, so don't be afraid to let things dry out a little more. Okay. Um, and by dry out, I mean just run lower humidity. And that's mm -hmm. just a personal thing. Um, everyone's tent's going to be different. I have run tents in different houses, and they've been very different. I see people do interviews with you, and I'm like, wow, that would not work for me because X, Y, Z. Um, and some of it's personal reasons. Some of it is the system you're running. So... Don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to uh, buy a product. It doesn't work out. Maybe it will come in handy later. You never know. So mm -hmm. yeah, have fun. That's cool. what it is at the end of the day. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, all those uh, informations and showing us uh, your tent. That's of a, a nice room. tent for sure. Oh. I appreciate With a lot it. of very nice cross. <laughs> I will yeah, have to get a few. <laughs> my pride and joy in here, that's for sure. 
Um, okay. Enjoy spending time in here and enjoy getting to catch up with you, Remy. Thanks for letting yeah, me rant same. for all this time. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. See ya. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you grow your name and test in a controlled environment like that, in a grow tense, please contact me and I will be more than happy to set an interview with you. Until next time, happy growing.